Bibles, take your Bibles and turn with me to Titus chapter 1. I appreciate Sister Katie singing before I preach. She, uh, she lights my fire, I'm telling you that. And if that didn't light your fire, your wood's wet. Uh, you need to do something about that. It was just a blessing uh, to hear uh, a person stand up here and, and just sing from their heart. What a blessing that is. And I was also utterly blessed to have Brother uh, Pagor uh, come and pick me up. And uh, I was afraid if he drove the speed limit, we'd never be here on time. So you know you know what happened, don't you? He got me here on time, and we appreciate that very, very much. And uh, it's good to see your your wife, Mrs. Pagor, and playing the piano. What a blessing the music ministry is um, to a church. It kind of lays the foundation, prepares the heart for the preaching of God's Word. And uh, thank you all so very much for participating in leading the singing, playing the music, and doing the special. It's good to be in the house of the Lord with God's dear people. Good to see some of you folks again uh, from last year, this year. And it's just nice to know that people, uh, people, some people are still faithful, still sticking with it. Amen? And we're just glad to be here tonight. One of my favorite stories about uh, Brother Ivan uh, Yoder is this. When he was younger, quite a bit younger, uh, he was a teenager, and uh, he didn't look like a teenager. He looked like a, a 10-year-old. And uh, he was about that tall and about that, that thick right there, you know. And, uh, boy, but he was sharper than a tack. He'd take a little stand and, and stand up on the stand so he could see over the pulpit. And uh, he'd start speaking. Everyone was always impressed with his, his, his skills there. And, uh, and I, I'm serious. He was, he was sharper than a tack. And uh, one of my concerns as, as he was uh, able to stand before the people and preach and this and that and give testimony was that it wouldn't go to his head and ruin him for life uh, by making him a big head. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we took trips uh, with our youth group trying to... We had what we call mission trips and we'd go down and we'd, uh, we'd go places and do things. And, and in the process... Uh, we'd get a motel. So all the guys was in one room and the girls was in another room. And I had this philosophy, the biggest person, the littlest person gets the bed. The rest had to just find wherever they could. So I was the biggest and Ivan was the littlest. All right? So we got in bed together and just before we went to sleep, I looked at Ivan and I said, fatty and skinny laying in bed. Fatty rolls over and guess who's dead? Well, sometime in the middle of the night, I wake up, and Ivan is on top of me. So I pick up his scrawny little body, and I put him on his side of the bed. But he's a sound asleep. He didn't know anything going on. A little while later, he's back on top of me. Three or four times that night, I had to pick him up and put him back on his side. So I, I trying to give him a hard time. And like I said, he's sharper than a tack. He's hard to get a good one over on. He really is. And so I was standing before a church, uh, I think it was the Roloff Ministries, I think that's where we told the story, and I said, this guy, I'm telling you what, <laughs> he, he ain't nobody ever going to sleep with me except my wife from here on out. That's it. I learned my lesson. That's just not going to happen. And it hasn't, brother. Uh, and I said, um, middle of the night, he was on top of me. I had to pick him up and put him over. Well, now it was uh, Ivan's time to testify. So he got up there, stood up there, and he says, folks, he said, I'll tell you how it really happened. He said, when big old pastor lay down, the bed went up like that, and I just rolled downhill. <laughs> I tell you, I couldn't win for losing. I'm telling you what. But um, he, he's been a joy to know and, and see God put his hand upon his life and upon his ministry and for him to marry in the Lord and raise a family. And it's just really been a blessing. And we love this guy so very much. And, of course, we love his daddy tremendously and his mother. Um, we're just so thankful to be in the ministry and working together for God's glory. And I am so honored to be here tonight. It is absolutely incredible uh, what great things God can do. Amen? Uh, are you at Titus chapter 1? Titus chapter 1. Uh, we've been on a fast, fast pace all day. We've been on a plane trying to uh, get here. And, um, and uh, we got here. But I feel like I'm still in fast forward. And so uh, it takes just a moment or two to kind of gather your thoughts and, and, um, and, and to present what God has put on your heart. And I, I believe that God is in this. 
and I'm excited about preaching it. And I hope it will be a blessing to your heart as well. Uh, Titus chapter 1, look with me at verse 1. Titus chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested His Word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of, of God our Savior. I think all of us can pretty well uh, understand verse 3, but hath in due times manifested His Word through preaching, which is committed unto us according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you'll help me to say what needs to be said. I pray that you'll open up our eyes and help us to behold wondrous things from your word. I pray, Father, that you'll open up our heart and help us to receive with thanksgiving the things of God. I pray, Father, that you will open up our minds and eyes and hearts uh, that we might uh, see the wonderful Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit of truth to lead us and to guide us in all truth. Now, Father, I pray uh, that you'll uh, do what you will do, and I pray that we'll do what we're supposed to do, and that's listen and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. May thy will be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to direct your attention also over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, a uh, familiar verse. Uh, you, you don't have to turn there unless you want to. Uh, but if I can get there, we'll, we'll get there. Is that in the Old Testament or the New Testament? 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. The Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now it's an honor to speak at this pastor's meeting. Now there's two things that I always look for when I go to a conference such as this. First of all, I go there with the idea that I want something to be said to help me to be a better pastor. Preacher's conference, pastor's conference. I want something to be said to help me to be a better pastor. And then I also want something uh, to be a, that I can revise and rework and use for our people as well. Uh, if, if the pastor can get squared away, God can use him to be a blessing to others. And so those are kind of two things that I look for when I come uh, to a meeting. I don't really come to a meeting looking for a message for Sunday, but I come to a meeting looking for something to take place in my life. And then if I can rework some things to use on Sunday, that's great, but that's not my, my motive. And I hope with God's help we accomplish some of this for you tonight. Uh, my message that I've called this is Poison Pills for Pastors and the People of Faith. Okay? Poison pills for pastors and the people of faith. A poison pills are used in the corporate world. It's to prevent a or or to hinder to prevent or to hinder a hostile takeover of a company. If someone acquires 51% of the shares, they can take over the company. They can do with it as they see fit. And so sometimes uh, some of the uh, the CEO or others will will get together and they will say this will have to be in order for you to take over. And so they'll put what they call a poison pill. And uh, they might say the CEO will need to be paid in full uh, for the next five years and all his officers. And the company that's going to take over, they may say, no, that's too much to, for us. That's, a, that, 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 that's not a deal for us at all. And it kind of poisons the deal. So poison pills are used in things like that. Uh, but also through the years, poison pills have been used for people to commit suicide in case they, um, uh, pilots many times would have a, 
a pill that they would swallow if they were captured by the enemy. And uh, they just didn't want to be abused. And I understand that there were several people at the Nuremberg trials that were uh, condemned to death. And, uh, and uh, they didn't get the joy of killing these mass murderers. Uh, instead, they took these poison pills and they killed themselves. Uh, I believe the devil has some poison pills for pastors. And I believe that he's in the business of trying to devour and destroy preachers. One of the saddest sights uh, I have seen in my 38 years of pastoring is preacher graveyards. I have seen young men with the call of God on their lives get discouraged by a preacher killing church. Now, if I, were to, if I were looking for a church, asking God to lead me, guide me, direct me to a church, one of the questions that I would ask the pulpit committee as they're uh, quizzing me about all these things, one of the things I would ask them is, uh, how many pastors have you had in the last ten years? If they say three, four, whatever, uh, that, that kind of tells you something. It's like a person that's had three or four wives in the last ten years. It's like a person that can't keep a job or can't find a place to stay and stay there. Just can't seem to find the will of God and plan His blessed assurance and just, and just make it work, you see? And so there's churches out there that I call preacher-killing churches and then they end up being a, a graveyard for these young preachers. I have also seen, seen young preachers uh, with, uh, that really shouldn't be in the ministry uh, they need to be working with somebody for a little longer to learn some things. They're young, they're inexperienced, they know how to kill a church. I've seen that as well. I've seen both, both, both sides. And uh, so, if a, if a pastor has been in several churches and he's wanting to pastor the church, uh, that ought to tell you something about him. And if a church can't keep a pastor, it ought to tell you something about them as well. I've always said, and I believe there's some truth to this, that when a pastor wants to buy a home, when he's pastoring a church, that means he's planning on staying. When a church is not excited about you buying a home, but you staying in the parsonage, uh, that kind of tells you that they're not interested in you staying because uh, you may be one of many uh, that will end up down the road someplace else. And so, uh, the devil has some poison pills for pastors. Now, Titus was very special to the Apostle Paul. And you could see that uh, there in the writings in verse 4. He said to Titus, My own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Uh, Titus was very, very special. Paul was wanting Titus to have a successful ministry. However, there were many, many problems with working with the Cretans. Uh, they were... Uh, uh, the, you know, the grass always looks greener in another pastor's ministry. You can see the highlights of his ministry and you can say, man, you had it easy. But they don't know the battle scars that that pastor has gone through to, for God to get it to this level where He can bless the church. And sometimes we look at others and we see what they have and we think that it came easy for them, which uh, is probably not the case. And the Apostle Paul had uh, Titus on his heart and was helping Titus to get through some of his issues and problems in the ministry. Uh, <clears throat> you see, Titus was told to set things in order and to ordain elders. Uh, to do his best to get things set in order, that was his, his calling, that was his job, that was his ministry, that was his God-given task, that was his responsibility and his alone. Now, because of the problems, he wanted to quit the ministry. I believe that's why the Apostle Paul says, I left thee in Crete. Stay in Crete. You see, and I believe that because of the, the, the problems, uh, we have a tendency of wanting to look someplace else because there's problems. This world is full of problems. I'm looking at problems right now. You're looking at a problem. Did you know that God has problems? I'm one of God's problems and so are you. He's the problem solver. The problem is, is preachers go and they think that it's going to be, you're going to stand up here and you're going to say some things and the people are going to follow and that's the way it's going to be. It isn't that way at all. 
It's like a marathon. It's not, it's not like a sprint. You may have to say the same thing a hundred times and then somebody else comes in and casually mentions it and then the light turns on for some. And then there's that tendency of getting jealous. Well, I, bless God, I've said that a thousand times. It doesn't matter, does it really? It doesn't matter. What matters is that God gets the glory and the person's light got turned on. Glory to God. That might be the reason why God had you had that person come in the beginning. Titus wanted to quit. Paul basically said, stay in Crete. All right, Titus was given a task, and that was to set things in order that are wanting and ordained uh, elders. Now, under the inspiration of God, Paul gave Titus orders to set these things in order and to ordain elders. That was his calling, and that was what he was supposed to do. Uh, we see that Paul also wrote Timothy, who also wanted to quit the ministry. Uh, he was about to quit the ministry. Uh, Paul reminded Timothy of the qualifications of a pastor because Timothy was about to misbehave in the house of God. Now, I, I've known preachers who have misbehaved in the house of God. Uh, I, I know one preacher that was telling me, he says, yeah, he said the chairman of deacons, he said some things, and I, pow, I had to let him know that he wasn't going to push the preacher around. And he said, we had, a, we had a fight in my office. Man, we just, uh, we, we, we were both bloody when it was all over with. But I won, bless God. Uh, that's misbehaving in the house of God. Uh, I, I, I know of another pastor that he told me, he said, here's what I did. And he said, the people wouldn't do what I wanted them to do. And I took my Bible and I threw it just as hard as I could. And I walked out and I hadn't been back since. Now why would you take God's Word and throw it against the wall? Something's wrong, see? Misbehaving pastors. I think that Timothy was about to, on the verge of misbehaving. Uh, that's why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, he says, but if I tarry long, that, they, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to believe the, behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. You see, I believe that Timothy was on the verge of misbehaving. Now, we ought to know that there's some devices that, de that the devil uses to try to destroy us. The Bible says, let, let, let Satan, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, there's three reasons why we should know the devil. One of the reasons is he was our father until we changed masters and got saved. Another reason was because... Uh, we have the book on him. I never recommend anybody finding out the devil apart from what the Bible says. I think that's dangerous. I think that's opening yourself up to some demonic things. I, I, I believe there's a devil and demons as much as I believe there's a God and angels. And uh, so I, 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 I don't even have theological books on, on demonology. I tear it up. I throw it out. I don't want anything to do uh, with what man says about demons. What I need to know is found in the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit of truth can lead us and guide us in what we need to know and what we need to tell our people. There's something captivating about some of these stories that people tell. I've had missionaries come from overseas and said, these folks are demon-possessed. Let me tell you some stories. I said, I'm not interested. Not interested. Now, the stories that Jesus tells, I'll listen and I'll read and I'll understand that. But I don't want to hear other stories about demonology. Okay? Uh, now, I'm going to tell you, the devil is in the, uh, the, the preacher killing business. And he uses these poison pills uh, to devour our spiritual effectiveness uh, and also to devour our desire to serve the Lord. Okay? And, and uh, as a people, uh, we must not be a part of that crowd that discourages pastors. We ought to be in the encouraging business. So I, I see that this applies to both people and pastor tonight. I'm trying to encourage the pastors uh, to, to stick with it and uh, not take one of those poison pills that the devil is trying to shove down your throat. And I'm trying to encourage the people not to be uh, tools in the hands of the devil by discouraging your pastor. Your pastor is just as human as you are. And he's going to make mistakes. He's going to say some things. He's going to do some things uh, that is not quite right but He's still the God-called man in the church. And the problem with some people is they don't understand that He is the God-called person. And, it, and, and uh, 
you know, and, and if he's the God called person, God knows he's, he's human and going to make mistakes. And so I want to encourage you to be an encourager. I don't want to encourage you to uh, discourage your pastor. I want you to encourage him in areas that you can encourage him. Uh, don't use flattery. Use a sincere heart in encouraging your pastor to be what he needs to be. And one of the ways that it helps me is when people say, Preacher, I'm praying for you today. I'm praying for you. God put you on my heart. I had a lady just not too long ago. She said, I woke up in the middle of the night. My pastor was on my heart. And uh, I prayed for you. And, and boy, I tell you what, that encourages me. I've had texts uh, coming to me all day today with various people from our church telling me we're praying for you for uh, tonight and for the church. I've asked our church, I said, look, I want to be what, what God wants me to be. I, I want to be what the people need. And I want to be what the pastor wants. And that's, that's a big plate to fill. But with God's help, it can be done. Amen? And so, what I'm trying to say here is the devil uses poison pills to try to, to, uh, to affect uh, us in ways uh, that would affect the ministry. Now, what are some of the ways, or what are some of the pills that the devil uses? I believe that he uses disappointments. Disappointments are poison pills for pastors and people of faith. Disappointments. Disappointments. All of us have been disappointed when we've not gotten what we think we want. Uh, someone asked me uh, uh, um, uh, for my birthday, what do you want? I said, just my way. Just my way. That's all I want. If I can have my way, I'll be very, very happy. I don't always get my way. But on my birthday, I ought to be able to have my way. My say so, my way. And uh, so they thought it was funny, but you know, there's some truth in that. And when we don't get our way, we get disappointed. And, you know, and, and what I want in a church is I want a, a happy, harmonious congregation that cooperates and gets along and, and moves together as an army of God for the cause of Christ. Now, I want that. But the sad fact of the matter is, it's not going to happen. There are, going to be, there are going to be people that are just not going to be moved. There are going to be people that come to church because that's the thing to do Sunday morning. And then there are going to be people that are live streaming that could come to church that don't come to church because it's so much easier to sit in your pajamas watching. Now, we're thankful for technology and we're thankful that people are able to watch. We have a host of people back in my church that are watching live stream. Uh, some of them can come to church. If they can go to a restaurant, they can go to church. If they can go to the grocery store, they can go to church. Now, if they're homebound, they're homebound. We understand that. But on any account, uh, the devil uses disappointments, and a pastor can be disappointed many ways. Things are not going the way he thinks they ought to go. We ought to understand that our disappointments are divine appointments. God knew exactly what was going on. God knows exactly what's happening. God knows who's going to be here, who's not going to be here. God knows all about that. We don't know, but we have some expectations, and when they're not fulfilled, we get disappointed. And sometimes those disappointments can, can uh, cause us to, to, to say things and do things that we shouldn't say and do, and have an attitude that we shouldn't have. Disappointments. The Bible says, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Do we really know that all things work together for good? Do we know that uh, we, we put the invitation out and uh, people will come and some won't and, and who comes is uh, God's in it? <laughs> and who don't come, God's still going to bless? Uh, God's, God knows all about it. And, and it's all going to work. It's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. Even if it's just you and your wife and children, it's going to be fine. I recall times as a pastor at Philadelphia Baptist Church, a little, little country church, population 200, counting cats, dogs, and canaries. And I was pastoring that church. And when I first got, got there, uh, we had uh, a host of people on Sunday morning, lesser on Sunday nights, and there were some Wednesday nights, zero. It was me, my wife, and my two little girls. What did you do? We preached. We, we sung hymns. We preached. We took up an offering. Stingy crowd. They didn't give much. 
wife, he said, oh, don't, don't be discouraged. I said, we're not, not discouraged. We just see where we need to work harder in some areas. We need to knock on some more doors. We need to do our best to try to reach people with the Gospel of Jesus Christ and encourage them. You know, if Jesus be exalted and lifted up, He'll do the drawing. And so what we need to do is be able to knock on that door and say, oh, let me tell you about, uh, uh, about someone uh, who is so special to me. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you start building Him up. Oftentimes, we build ourselves up. Sometimes, we build our church up. Now, let's not do that. Let's build up the Lord's church. The Bible Baptist Church of Brookings belongs to the Lord. And God is doing some phenomenal things at the Bible Baptist Church. And you know what can make it greater? is if you are a part of the group. I mean, you can encourage and you can exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and He'll do the drawing. I believe that disappointments are poison pills for pastors and people of faith. I believe that also discouragement is a poison pill for pastors and people of faith. Discouragement. I believe that disappointments lead to discouragement. Uh, I, I, and discouragement uh, happens, <laughs> again, when we don't get our way. We, we think it needs to be a certain thing and it's not a certain thing. We're, we're, we're discouraged. Um, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Verse 28, Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. Uh, discouraged people want to quit. Did you know that? That's why it's a, it's a tool of the devil uh, to put on pastors and the people of faith is to be discouraged so that uh, their next step is to get out and get away. You get angry. Uh, it just, it, and just, it just keeps on keeping on. When I accepted my first church, I was there a week before I found out what my paycheck would be. I just didn't ask questions and they sure didn't tell me. And so I moved all the way from Oklahoma uh, City all the way to uh, Philadelphia, Missouri, the northeast corner of Missouri. And I had my wife and my two little girls. And uh, we come in and Tammy said, well, what are we going to get paid? I, I don't know. We just have to trust the Lord. And I, I believe that there's a God in heaven capable of, uh, of making things work. And so uh, the first week we were there, I said, well, looky here exactly half of what we need to survive. <laughs> Isn't the Lord good? I mean, He's going to have to prove Himself mightier. This, or we're going to sink for sure. I was a machinist, and uh, I had all these machining tools in my garage. And there, would, uh, there was discouraging moments that I would go to my garage and just kind of reminisce the fun times it was working those machines and using those tools. And I realized that that was creating a lust to going back to the leeks and the garlics of, of Egypt. And so I told my wife, I said, we're going to need to get rid of these tools. Well, you're not ever going to get as much as you paid for them. I said, no, but we need to get rid of them because it's one of these things, either we swim or we sink. And in the ministry, we're either going to swim or we're going to sink. We're not going to fall back on what we used to be before God opened the door for us to pastor a church. And so we just cut ties and got rid of the tools. And so now it was, Lord, we're going to have to swim. And so uh, then came along uh, the, the first year, the first year of ministering there. Uh, our church had uh, just about doubled in attendance. We had a lot of people saved. A lot of baptisms that first year. Not bad for a community of 200. We had over 100 people in church. Uh, in a matter of uh, five years, we were able to baptize over 100 people. And we didn't even have a baptistry. We had to go down the road uh, 13 miles to uh, baptize in a church. And we even baptized in a, in a pond. Were, were you baptized in a pond? Or? Okay, your sister was, okay. Okay. Uh, who ever heard of a Baptist church that was 100 years old that don't have a baptistry? Somebody didn't have any vision to think that you need a baptistry in a Baptist church. Amen. Why? Because you're going to get people saved and they need to be baptized. So, so the first year came about and uh, they had their annual committee, a finance committee, 
uh, and, and they picked a lady uh, to head it up. Okay. They said, she's smart. She's a school teacher. She's smart. Well, I know you've got to be smart to be a school teacher, but she wasn't a math teacher. She was uh, something else. But it, it doesn't matter. So anyway, so we sat in there, and here sat, here sat the, all the trustees, all the deacons. Oh, here's something else. Why do you need five deacons for a church running less than 100? In the early church, how many deacons did they have uh, when the church was running tens of thousands? Why do we need so many deacons? You need deacons when you need deacons. You don't need deacons otherwise. You know what I'm saying? I'm not put, putting down deacons. I'm just saying churches don't need deacons unless, until they need deacons. And then when they need them, they need an appropriate matter for their size. And so here were all the deacons, and here were all the trustees, and here I was, here's the treasure, and here's that lady. And so she goes, proceeds to tell us, she says, okay, we're going to adjust everything, and we're going to see uh, uh, just uh, how we can increase uh, funds for everything. All right, now, uh, the church had a lot of money in the bank. Uh, the church had doubled. We had more people, more people giving, more people attending. I mean, they were doing quite well. And uh, so, um, and, and by that time, <laughs> my wife and I, we maxed out our credit cards. We sp spent all of our savings. I mean, we were, that was it. <laughs> it was one of those sink or swim times, you know. Uh, financially, either we we're going to keep on or we're, we're going to sink. And so, um, I sat in there and uh, this lady uh, proceeded and she says, okay, we're going to make some adjustments uh, on, the, on the electric and upon everything. I'm just uh, the yard keep, everything, the janitor, everything. And if there's any money left over, we'll consider giving the pastor something. I laughed. I thought that was funny. She looked at me and she said, I'm serious. I said, oh, yes, ma'am. You know, I, I thought the pastor had just a tad bit more authority than that. I thought he was the God-called leader of the church. But this lady, she knew how to supersede her authority over God's man and the men of the church as well. And so when it was all said and done, now it got down to my part, and she said, you may leave while we discuss your salary. But before you leave, do you have any needs? And I put my pet puppy dog look on. We, we would sure like to have another child this year. You know, that puppy dog look don't, don't always help, but I did the best I could. And then she said, okay, you're dismissed. And so I went out into the auditorium sitting there thinking, Lord, there's just something not right about any of this. Lord, I've worked my heart out this last year. We've seen people saved. He was one of them saved. We've seen a lot of people come into the church. This church has never seen anything like what had happened. Never. Well, this is just not right. And then one of the deacons came and got me, and he says, set me down. And uh, she, she, she proceeded, and, and she didn't even tell me what kind of a raise I got. And finally, uh, this one deacon put $10 a week uh, on a piece of paper. $10 a week. It was hard to get happy over $10 a week. Hard. So we went home. Just crossed the street, went home. What did I do? I cried. Because I, get, I had a pity party. I said, Lord, we, we gave up this, we gave up that, we've spent it all, we don't have anything, sink or swim, we're there. What are we going to do? Lord, you led me here. These people are not generous at all. Led by a woman. I think men ought to be the leader of the church. I think it's very clear in the Bible. Suffer not that a woman should teach or usurp authority over a man. Now, it doesn't mean that men are, are, are better than women. No, no, no. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. If it wasn't for the precious ladies of the church, 85% uh, of the work wouldn't get done. They have a heart. And if you, uh, when, when an invitation is given, it's generally the lady that will be touched uh, with the things of God first. You want your ladies. I'm not putting ladies down. You know anything about me, you know I'm not putting them down at all. But she's out of place. And the men allowed her to be out of place. So I went home that night, and I went to bed, and from uh, 10 to 11, uh, I was tossing and turning and just, just crying in my soul, saying, Lord, that's not right. 
And from 11 to 12, I was crying some more, saying, Lord, it's not what. From 1 to 2, uh, 2 to 3, and somewhere between 3 and 4, the Lord reminded me to be uh, content with such as I have. That He's the one that called, and He's the one that provides. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's like, well, God was going to make it work. If He couldn't use those stingy people there at that church, God was still going to make it work. This is God's work, not mine. God's work. And so I went to church the next opportunity and they had the whole congregation and they stated before the whole congregation, they said, okay, we're going to give our pastor a $10 a week raise. All those in favor and everybody. So I got my $10 a week raise and it, it wouldn't have, my heart was so, so, different at that point uh, it would, it, if they would have said a thousand dollar a week raise it wouldn't have made me any more happier because God had gotten a hold of my heart and reminded me of some things and I'm going to tell you some things uh, that was a moment the devil was trying to poison Pastor Tim Stowe and create a despair thinking what are we going to do we're going to sink what are we going to do there's a third poison pill that I want to mention tonight, and that is despair. Despair. To despair is to give up hope. I believe I was teetering between giving up hope and going back uh, to Oklahoma City and working for the job that I really enjoyed working for. Or ministering to the people that God had given me. Boy, I'm so glad that the decision was made. Uh, right, rightly made. That little church, God has used that little church. There's missionaries and preachers around the country and around the world as a result of that little church. Lives have been touched. Hearts have been changed. And God, are, God is using them uh, to affect communities here and there, including Brookings, including Cahoka. We must not forget God is involved in every facet of our lives. In the midst of our troubles, He's either caused it or He's allowed it. Do you believe that? God has either caused it or He's allowed it. God is always and forever in control. And there's nothing that surprises God. I'm surprised. Can you imagine God saying that? Oh, I'm surprised. That's, that's a statement you can never hear. Huh? God's not surprised. He knows all about everything all the time. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 8, uh, from the heart of the Apostle Paul, he said, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Uh, in other words, he says, we have a heavenly hope. <laughs> Our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in God above. Uh, God... God is going to take care of things. God is going to make it all happen. God is in control. And when we get to the place where we understand that God is in control, why are we going to despair at the point of trying to give up? And see, that's what I've seen through the years. Good men of God have gotten to the point where they've despaired and they've given up. And when they've given up, given up their life has gone the wrong direction. Their family has gone haywire. And at the end of their life, they wish they had never made that decision to give up and go back. Despair is a poison pill. Doubt is a poison pill for pastors. Satan attacked Eve with doubt in the garden. He got her to doubt. He said unto the woman, Yea, hath God, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And today, the devil is still trying to cause us to doubt God's word. I am so glad He has given us the inerrant, infallible King James Bible. Okay? Now, if it's perfect, why are we looking for another? You can't improve perfection. I remember what Brother Roloff used to say, we don't need to rewrite it, we need to reread it. This is the Word of God. And we need to stand firmly uh, upon the Word of God. You know, at our, in our church, 
When we built our new facility, God enabled us to build a new facility about eight years ago, eight years ago. And uh, beneath the, the platform up here is a King James Bible. Okay? And, and so when we stand behind the pulpit, we're standing on the Word of God. Now, every entrance into our church, whether it be side doors, emergency doors, whatever, every entrance in our church behind the sheetrock is a King James Bible. You can't come in or go out of the Word of God without going through the Word of God. We're trying to make much of the Word of God. One day, when the Antichrist takes over and we're with the Lord, and they try to turn our church into a warehouse of some sort, and they tear down some walls, guess what they're going to find? They're going to find some Bibles. They're going to know that there's somebody that believes the Bible is the Word of God. That's what we are. Now, what the devil is in the business of is he's in the business of trying to get you to doubt God's Word. Now, if we will read it and believe it and take it as it is instead of trying to figure things out, uh, we'll be better off. But far too often we start listening to what other people say about the Word of God. We start reading what other people say about the Word of God. And then we start listening to them as if there's some authority greater than the authority of God's Word. You know, I don't mind quoting somebody from time to time, but some people, that's their whole ministry. So-and-so said this, blah, blah, blah. So-and-so said that, blah, blah, blah. And such and such, and so-and-so, and Spurgeon, and this person, and that person, and this person. And, that, and then they give an invitation. Oh, why not quote God? He's a good source. He's the one that wrote this book. God. And I'm sure that these great men of God of the past wouldn't have a problem with that at all. Because they were quoting God. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. As Johnny Flanagan used to sing, what's wrong with the old black book my daddy used to read from? Is it so outdated by modern translations? Good news, revised standard and good news, everywhere I look, won't somebody tell me what's wrong with the old black book? They're making plans in years to come to take God from our minds by giving us new Bibles change a little bit each time. Well, we've got hundreds and hundreds of versions of Bibles. And basically what it is, it's somebody making money. Basically, that's what it is. You take the King James Bible, you can reproduce it, and you can send it anywhere, and you're okay. But you take one of their versions and you reproduce it and you give it out, you could go to prison because it's copyrighted and somebody's got to make some money. You see? God wants the Word of God spread throughout the world. Alright? So I believe that doubt is a poison pill. I believe that disbelief is a poison pill for pastors as well. Disbelief is an act of the will. I, I just cannot believe that. I... I it, it, I just cannot believe it. I believe it's an act of the will. To disbelieve God or His Word is a choice. The Bible says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be uh, any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Hebrews chapter 3, and verse 12. And of course, Hebrew is deal dealing with the, the, the Jews that had gotten saved and was considering going back uh, to, to pre-salvation days. And, and, and what they would have to do is what they uh, accepted and believed, they would have to uh, choose to disbelieve those things to go back. Disbelief is a choice. What I'm trying to say is, disbelief is a poison pill for pastors. I can't believe it. I won't believe it. I just, well, believe it. <laughs> uh, so often we, we think people are more mature in the faith than what they really are. And we find out they're not nearly as mature in the faith as what we thought. So what do we do? Do we put them down? Or do we uh, ignore them? Or do we, uh, what do we do? Oh, we try to bring them to that next level of spirituality. I, I have talked to many a young preacher and I've said, look, uh, when you have problems in the church, it is, it's eye-openers on what your church needs. And you, you address the problems in a very tactful, biblical way. Uh, and you, you don't do it 
tomorrow, you know, someone has, you don't do it tomorrow, but as the Lord gives you uh, leadership on that area, you start working on it. It's, it's wonderful to be able to, to, to be able to see some things. When I, when I went to Philadelphia Baptist Church uh, uh, there in northeast Missouri, uh, when I went there and became pastor, it was obvious over, just obvious, it just stood out uh, the needs of the church, the spiritual needs of the church. And I didn't know what I could do. I was young. I was inexperienced. I was the first pastor I've ever had. I didn't know. And, and we worked with what we had, and God was growing my faith and teaching me as well as some of the people in the church. But, but there could have been many a time we could have just, uh, just chunked it all in and, and, and gone someplace else. Uh, but, but we didn't. We stayed by the stuff. We decided that this was God's will and we were going to do God's will uh, regardless. Because God led us. And I believed... When they only gave me that $10 raise, I believe then if, if we sink, that's the will of God. Whatever. Lord, my life is yours to control. And, I, and with God's help, I'm going to have the right attitude toward the very people that you've given me. And so, uh, it was obvious to me that there was all kinds of issues that I needed to deal with. Can you imagine coming to church and there's that big old fat Santa Claus on Christmas? Don't you think Christmas ought to be about Christ? Yes. Some of them were sizing me up and saying, Preacher, you make the best Santa Claus. And I went from there to the church in Texas that hardly even believed in Christmas. And so I went from a very liberal thinking to a very conservative thinking and what we did with this liberal group, we tried to make them a little, just, just a little more conservative as best as we could. And with that conservative group that was too tight, we tried to help them to loosen up. Now after 33 years, uh, we've seen a lot of good progress. We're there. And there's a lot more to go. But it took me a whole year of being there before I could see their problems and their needs. Uh, that this preacher had to deal with. I, it, I, it wasn't obvious. It was obvious at Philadelphia, but it wasn't obvious at Bevo Baptist. And so if God has given you a ministry, just open up your eyes, open, your, open up your heart, and don't, don't look at it as something negative. Look at it as something positive. God is allowing you to see some things that you're going to be a, a part of. And He's the problem solver. He's going to take those problems and He's going to solve it. I found out a long time ago that if you'll just outlive your problems, uh, your problems won't be around. You just, it's just determined. Look, I'm young and, and, and they're, they're in their uh, mid-80s and, uh, and they've been a headache to the church for all these many years. I'm just going to outlive them. That's what I'm going to do. I refuse to die. Now, we were laughing about that, but sad to, sad to say that's a, that's a problem. That's a problem. I'm dealing with a young man uh, that uh, he says, boy, uh, they're twice my age. Uh, the powers that be. That's exactly what it was for me when I was in Philadelphia. They were twice my age. The powers that be. <laughs> and now I'm twice their age. But it gets better. It will stay by the stuff. Because the devil wants to poison some things. And he wants, he wants you to be a, a people of faith that will uh, be a part of the devil's plan to destroy and devour the pastor, the man of God. Encourage him. Help him to stay by the stuff. He's just as human as, as everybody else is. Then there's dishonesty. It's a, it's a poison pill for pastor. You know, a, a half truth told as a whole truth is an untruth. My wife would say to me in the morning, she would say, did you have a taco? And because I didn't eat so much uh, at, at noontime, she'd say, did you have a taco? And I could look at her in her God-given eyeballs and say, no, no, okay. But then I realized I better tell her the whole truth and nothing but the truth. 
I had two tacos. <laughs> you see how I could have deceived her with, I was truthful. No, I did not have a taco. I had two tacos. All right. There's a whole lot of that going on in the church. And there's a whole lot of that with preachers sometimes. I've seen them uh, do business meetings at a certain time because certain people they knew wouldn't be there. They didn't believe there's a God in heaven that can control things. I think you need to do what you need to do and, and just not have an ulterior motive except to honor and glorify God. I, I, I don't think that... I, I, I knew one pastor one time, he, he had all these tricks up his sleeves. I, I had a preacher one time, uh, not in my church, I went to another church, and, and, and here's what the preacher did. He got all the preachers. Uh, he, he dismissed everybody else. got all the preachers. He said, I'm going to teach you how to baptize people. He says, when you give an invitation, have them all stand in line over there. And when they're standing in line, <laughs> that's a baptismal line. And you do this. You are planning on getting baptized, aren't you? Where's the Spirit of God in any of that? I walked away from there uh, shaking my head thinking, you use deceit and trickery to try to get people baptized? Is that, is that the way to do it? Or, or, or do we use trickery to try to get, get our way in the church? Is that the way to do it? Well, of course, there's always going to be somebody that's going to be no. It's amazing. You could have 100 people and 99 say, yes, we believe it's of God, but there's going to be one person that says, no, we don't. If I was the one person... Uh, saying no to the and 99 saying yes we believe I'd be examining myself on some things but that kind of person doesn't do it they just think that well I'm going to take a stand and I've got to stand against the majority but that's what I think and, and they've not spent one ounce of prayer not one ounce of prayer and yet they want to control some things uh, dishonesty is a poison pill for pastors Apostle Paul said this to the church at Corinth he says, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Dishonesty should not be a part of the people of faith or the man of God. Defilement is a poison pill for pastors. Defilement. Defilement is to mix impurity with purity. It's to kind of blend things that shouldn't be blended. Uh, when you mix the two, we get a defilement. The Bible says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. And if any man defile the temple of God, uh, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Uh, to be defiled is to be contaminated. If you had a five-gallon bucket of pure water, and you took one drop of cesspool water, and you put it in that pure water, just the one drop, uh, would it be pure or impure? It'd be impure. Exactly. And so sometimes we allow things to happen that shouldn't happen at all in the church of, of Jesus Christ. In scriptures, uh, we see <laughs> the leper. He was quarantined uh, until he can prove that he was clean uh, by the priest. And, and the men of God ought to be uh, standing upon the pure things of God's Word. And when we start allowing things to come in that shouldn't get there, uh, there's been a many, a, there's been a, been a many of independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, Christ-exalting, big B Baptist churches that have fallen by the wayside because they've allowed things to come in. We live in South Texas. South Texas is right not too far from the border. How many tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of illegal uh, aliens crossing that border? They're in the fields killing cows so that they can eat. Uh, they don't, some of them don't travel by the roads unless they, they're afraid of being picked up. So they go from, from field to field to field to field and they get hungry and they kill the animals to eat. Some break into homes. Some have hurt. Now, I'm going to say the vast majority of them just want a better life. But they're not legal. And they're trying to take Texas and turn it blue. The powers that be. 
And Texas is trying to put up a, a border there to protect the United States because they're going by the tens of thousands into your neighborhood. And, 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 and how do they support themselves? Before long, some of them start stealing. Not all of them, because many of them just want a better life. And I understand that. I don't have a problem with that. But do it right. But when you start bringing people in, and we see this everywhere, when you start bringing people in and they don't acclimate to America, then you have this group and that group and this group and that group. And before long, they have to have all these different languages to communicate with them. And they have to teach them in schools with these different languages uh, to, to teach. And uh, they, they just not acclimated. If, if, if I went to Rome, I would, I would become a Roman. <laughs> I would learn the Roman way and talk the Roman talk. When people come into America, they ought to acclimate. When people come into the independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, Christ-exalting, Baptist church, they ought to acclimate. I have told people from time to time, read the sign out there. It says, independent, fundamental, Baptist. We're not a non-denominational church and we're certainly not a charismatic church. We don't believe in yabba dabba doing and seeing things that aren't there and hearing things that aren't said. And yet they want to come in and they think that that ought to be a part of the services. Read the sign out there. We are one Baptist church that is Baptist. And I have said for, for years, would to God that these half Baptists would take the name Baptist off their church uh, so that they can just be what they are. Confused. Aren't you glad the store wherever the store is, whatever kind of store you have here, uh, aren't you glad they have labels on the canned goods? If they didn't have labels, you wouldn't know what you were getting. And when you walk into an independent Baptist, you ought to know you're going to get something from the King James Bible. And you're going to get the Word preached to you. And you're going to see the devil defeated. And, and God's people get victory as a result. You ought to expect some things being in uh, an independent Baptist church. But if you start allowing people in without baptizing them and making them what you are and teaching them what you are, then you're going to get just all sorts of people. Preacher, I think sister such and such ought to be uh, the, the adult teacher uh, for men and women. Oh yeah, she's a good lady. Well, where would you get that idea? You had to bring that in because uh, it, that, that's not Bible and that's not what we teach, preach, or practice. You see? So we've got, to, we've got to make them what we are. That's why one of the many reasons I don't accept non-Baptist baptism. Amen. If they come in and they say, well, I'm saved, and I'm convinced they are saved, but I was baptized by this non-denominational church. First of all, I don't think they have the authority to baptize. Uh, if you can just see what they believe, they certainly don't believe and practice what Jesus taught. And so you make them what you are. And baptism is part of the process. And so, what I'm talking about is, is defilement is a poison pill for pastors and the people of faith. Let me, let me give you one, one more. Unnecessary debt is a poison pill for pastors and the people of faith. Unnecessary debt has destroyed many homes and kept many people out of church to make more money. When your outgo is greater than your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7, the rich ruleth over the poor. And the borrower is servant to the lender. And when churches unnecessarily get into debt, unnecessary. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with being in debt because the Bible teaches you how to take care of things and how to treat people and not overcharge people that are in debt. But when you get unnecessarily in debt, 
You've got to have bigger, finer, uh, fancier things than what you're capable of handling. What are you going to do when things don't work out the way you planned? Well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to be disgraced and all of a sudden there's going to be a church someplace else and that, then, then the people are left holding the debt. And now they've got to get a pastor in and they can't really do him right because they're so busy paying a debt off that they got that was unnecessary. You see? What I'm trying to say is uh, go into debt when, there's, when, when, you, when you need to if you, if you have to go that route. Uh, when we had decided, we were in a situation where we had to, we had to build. And uh, so uh, we came together as, as, as men of the church and, and I said, okay, it wasn't my idea because by faith, I didn't see it. Well, they saw it. I didn't see it. I said, okay, let's make one thing clear. We're not going to borrow. Not one penny. Amen. Not one penny. We're going we're gonna to trust the Lord. God can't do it. Can't be done. Why should the Church of Jesus Christ go down to a, a bank and beg them for their money? Okay? So, we're not going to borrow. Not one penny. Not one penny. I thought that would settle everything. And so we'd start taking up a fund. I knew what was in our church, and I know our people, and we're, we're, we don't have money in our church, so I guarantee you. This was July the 4th, year 2010. By December, we had $50,000 in the bank. $50,000. And then by the next spring, we had $100,000. Wow. And then my wife and I went to a restaurant and they said, Pastor, this is such and such. And I said, such and such, I prayed for you. How's your heart doing? It's an old man. And he said, my heart's doing fine. And he said something and I said something. I teased with him a little bit. He teased back. And he looked at his wife and nudged her and my wife and his wife had hit it off. And he looked at her and he says, we're going, he said to me, he said, young man, we're going to come visit your church. Now, I'm always impressed when anybody calls me a young man. <laughs> I've heard that countless times. We're going to come to your church. And guess what? No, not for about three months. And then one day he walks in. And we're still just going strong as we can do. I mean, we're... We're praying, we're giving all we can do. And by the way, you can't build churches off of pocket change. You've got to, there, there, there needs to be some sacrifice given. And when, when God sees that you're sacrificing and you're giving what you can do and you're making sacrifices to do it, uh, then, then other resources come in. And so, uh, first time I saw the guy in church, I shook his hand. I said, man, it's good to, good to see you. And he pulled out a check for $9,000. He said, put that in your building fund. Whoa. Okay. Now, I don't know anything about this man. Zip zero. He doesn't dress like a millionaire. He doesn't look like a millionaire. Uh, no, none of that. He doesn't sound like one. He handed me $9,000. Two weeks later, he comes back to church. And I say, hey, it's good to see you. He hands me another $9,000. Two weeks later, he hands me another $9,000. Two weeks later, he hands me about $6,000. About this time, I'm thinking, well, I better go out and visit him. <laughs> I better go see this guy. You see, rich folks intimidate me. I don't have a problem with poor people. I don't have a problem with ignorant people. I have a problem with smart people. I don't measure up. But everybody needs to be saved. So I decided I was going to go out there. So I got his address. And when I got his address, I couldn't believe what I saw. And when I went into his house, I thanked him for what he gave us. And I reminded him that there's no strings attached. And he says, not, not one string attached. Not one. Absolutely zip, zero, nothing. And I talked to him about his salvation. He'd been saved uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, but hadn't been in church in 40 years. And this, our church was the first time in 40 years he'd been in church. And he's been there several times. And every time he comes, he hands me a check. Never puts it in the offering. Always in my hand. And it went time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. And they were hooked up in a lawsuit with millions of dollars at stake. 
And his wife and him said, Preacher, would you pray that, 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 that something will take place and we can get out of this lawsuit? It, it, it's at the Supreme Court. And, and so I said, okay, let's pray. So we prayed. With, with, before the week was over, it, before they, they said, we'll be generous with the church. <laughs> what have you been so far? <laughs> but I prayed. And before Sunday, it was settled. Millions of their dollars had been untied up. He says, preacher, how much do you need now to finish paying off this, uh, what you need for your church? But I didn't know that things had been settled. I just said, well, we're, we're, we're down to our last 80000 There it is. You know how all that happened? It happened the first year I was pastoring Bevo Baptist Church. And they owed for everything. They owed for their main building, the other buildings, their vehicle. They owed for their parsonage. They owed for uh, another piece of property. They owed for everything. They couldn't hardly do anything uh, with me uh, and, and pay me uh, because of what they owed. Even the Sunday school teachers had to buy their own materials. We were heavily in debt. And this one building came up. Uh, it was a balloon payment, and it came up. And so I had to go to the bank and talk to the bankers. And so I went to the bank with my hat in my hands, and, uh, and I said, look, um, uh, we're going through some rough times and, and this and that, and, but uh, can you give us a better interest rate for the next five years? They went in, discussed, they come out, and they gave us the highest interest rate they could give us. I said, what happened? They said, well, you look like a credit risk. I said, I promised you my salary. You, you're not going to be done, with, done out on anything. I promised you my salary. And, and they said, well, you look like a credit risk. That's what our decision is, and this is what it is. I slid out of that bank. I went back to my office. I cried, and I said, Lord, I, this is just not right. This is just not right. This is not right. It's not right. And then God put something on my heart. He says, why don't you challenge the people that in three years you can be debt free? Now, that was way before we built the new building. Way before. And so I challenged the people. Now, it was all we could do to just hang on. <laughs> all we could do. And we started nickel and diming, nickel and diming, and nickel and diming. And within three years, uh, God made it happen. We were debt free. And I made a promise then to the church. We get out of debt, we won't never get in debt again. I know what it is to be under the burden of the load. Folks, I know what it is now to be on top of the load. Okay? And how did that all happen? It all happened because God answered our prayer and got us out of debt so that the next time we thought we needed to borrow, we didn't. We did it by faith, and God did a miraculous thing. What I'm trying to say here is um, unnecessary debt is a poison pill for pastors churches, people of faith. Did you know that more divorces uh, are, are happen as a result of people being in debt? I mean, they start picking at each other. Well, uh, you should have bought that and you shouldn't have bought that and, and, and we're in debt now because and they're, uh, they're calling us and they're harassing us. And, and by the way, the same thing happens to the church. And they start pointing their fingers at each other and toward the pastor and this and that. And there's issues and problems in the church. It never should be. Because of unnecessary debt. Now, I'm not talking about necessary debt. I'm talking about unnecessary debt. If we can just trust God. If we can just ask God to lead us, guide us, direct us. Help us. Give us His mind. And then give us His resources. God's will, done God's way, will not lack God's support. And we've got to believe God. There's, there's, the devil is trying to devour you. He's trying to destroy the church. He's trying to destroy your homes. He's trying to destroy your effectiveness as a, as a pastor and as a church. He's trying to do all that. And he's got all kinds of poison pills that he's sending your way in hopes that he will accomplish it. And he's had a great measure of success. Let's not be his next victim. With God's help, let's, I believe God and no matter what happened, God has allowed it to happen. We trust God. And there's something for me to learn. I, I, Paul said, 
I believe God. It's going to happen. And we just have to trust that God will have His way in His timing. Let's everyone stand, please.